Okay. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Um, my name is Amanda, and uh, we are here today to talk about USAS, um, gener generating reports slash best practices. So uh, we're going to be talking reports today, and uh, we are sticking in USAS for this one. All right. So I, I have my wiki page pulled up here. Let's see. Okay. Yes, I'm sharing. Everything looks good. Okay. So uh, before we jump right in, I just want to say, um, as we go, like, I definitely have quite a few things to show. We'll hop around and look at reports. But if you have questions about anything on the along the way, uh, let me know. I do have my chat window open, so I'll keep an eye on that. Or feel free to unmute and ask a question at any time if you would like to. Okay. Okay, so um, I'm going to hop over to the software here and we'll just log in. Before we actually get started looking at reports, uh, the very first thing I have is um, is talking about <laughs> the canned reports versus the template reports. Um, I was reviewing my notes for this training and I was like, okay, if, if you've been to a reports training before, you know we've talked about this. Um, if you're new, this is something that's going to be important, but certainly when we're looking at best practices, I was like, you know what, we just, we need to kick it off with at least just talking the basics of um, having some of the reports that have template versions and canned versions and why that is, because um, that is going to come into play here. So, all right. Um, so when we're talking this, so if if this isn't something that's familiar to you, you may hear, you'll definitely hear in the trainings um, or like in tickets with us, um, you'll hear us re refer to a canned report or a template report sometimes. And the canned reports are always going to be found on this report menu. So anything that you can run directly from here, like if I come in here, there's a budget summary, there's a financial detail. And I can click this and it's going to take me to a page to run that report. Now, if I go back to my home page, um, you'll see I have some of these reports that are favorited on my home page or also in the report manager. And um, you can see on this list, some of these reports are the same. Like we see budget summary, we see financial detail. And so the reason that this is, um, back when USAS started, uh, pretty much the vast majority of reports, and there's still mostly template reports on the USAS side, but most reports were built based off of these template formats. And um, when we're in this report manager, these template reports have the ability where we could go in to any one of these reports and... Um, don't worry, we're not jumping into customizing right away, but for a visual, you could come in and customize any one of these template reports. So, you know, definitely like when districts were coming over from Classic, there was certain reports that uh, there was like report writers that people could use. And so this was something when we started where it was having this flexibility on every single report to customize every single thing. And uh, that is a great feature to the template reports. What we found over time though, is especially a lot of these reports that they use regularly um, and ones that maybe they're not always needing customized. Like in many cases, it's like, I just want it for a certain group of accounts or maybe I want everything for my entire fiscal year. Well, when they started using some of these reports like financial detail, budget summary, for just say they're just running it wide open, that can be a lot of data. And so what we found with these template reports is because they had this like built-in ability to just be customized to do anything possible, that wasn't allowing the efficiency to be able to run the quickest way possible. So, um, when we got requests that said, hey, you know, we need these reports to run quicker, we need a performance improvement, especially for these large data sets, if you're running it for a whole year, that sort of thing. What we did then is we rewrote those as canned reports. And what that allowed our development team to do is, 
yeah, this doesn't have, like, if I go into this budget summary, I don't have a thing where I can just immediately look at the setup and, and change every single thing about the report. But because of that, they could program it so that it would run more efficiently. And, um, you know, some of you I know have heard me talk about this before, but um, I'm going to be a broken record on it because these are just so, so, so much quicker. Financial detail report for, certain, for like, uh, d d some data sets are up to like 99.99 improvement on how fast it runs. Um, some of them are still up there. Like it's just, it's the difference between sometimes a report timing out and a report actually finishing. So that's my little speech about that. And, and the reason that I felt like it was important to talk about it First of all, so if you hear me saying canned report <laughs> or template report, that's what I'm talking about. Second of all, we're, we're kicking this off as best practices. If you have a district that's running a report or if you are a district watching this back later and you're running a report and it's one of these template reports and it's taking forever and it might be timing out, the number one thing that you can do to improve that, um, the better practice would be to try and use one of these canned reports. Um, immediately that's going to be a huge performance improvement. Um, now, I also understand, though, that there are reasons that people are still using the template reports. Maybe they have something customized or that's the way that they've always run it. Um, there's some reason why they, you know, aren't using this report or don't think they can. And so now that I've gone on my rant, um, I, I want to start off with that because what we're going to do now is we're going to go look and we're going to kind of go through these report options, talk about these things that you can do in the report. And I hope through the discussion, some of the things that we look at, maybe if you um, do have a situation where uh, a template report is being used, this will give you some tools to kind of way. Maybe we can do this a little bit different way. Um, and even though it's different, like if you're going to see a huge performance improvement in time, that might be worth taking a different step afterwards or some, something of the sort. So um, so let's get started with the uh, account activity report is what I'm going to um, hop in first here. And what this is, so this one is a report that was rewritten to replace template reports. So this one replaces the budget account activity and the revenue account activity, but it's both in one now. So account activity report, and when you come in here, you would either select budget or select revenue. And that's going to determine which side it's going to show you the activity for. Okay. And so when we're talking about this, yeah, let me just move my notes a little bit over here. Okay. So when we are... Um, talking about this account activity report, what this is including and what this is going to show us is it's going to be a listing of all the activity, which equals transactions, basically, all of the transactions that are within. Um, so the budget side, it would be anything that's posted to an expenditure account. Revenue side, anything that's posted to a revenue account. So budget, we're going to see uh, checks. Um, we can see reduction of expenditures. Um, the revenue side is going to be receipts, refunds, that, that sort of thing. So it's just going to actually list out the transactions making that up. All right. Okay. Um, now, what I'm going to do, I'm going to kind of go through this. these fields. We'll skip around just a little bit uh, just to... Um, what I feel like I have laid out to kind of make sense um, for when we're looking at this. But the first thing is talking about these start and stop dates. So uh, because this is an activity-based report, so, and that's why I think I wanted to kind of go through and talk about what that means. You know, So we're seeing a list of transactions. Um, some reports, like when we think about like a budget summary or a cash summary, that's showing you totals that already exist. But when we're looking at anything that is activity-based, it's giving us transactions, that's where we have this option for a start and stop date. And what that date is going to represent is what are the dates on the transactions. So in this case, if I have a check that's dated July 5th, 
it'll fall in this range. You know, so basically it's what dates do I want on the transactions, anything that starts with this date, anything that um, has a date between these two, basically. So these are transaction dates. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I have these uh, in there from the previous time I ran it. And um, I actually, yeah, it's okay. We can have it till yesterday. But basically I'm going to do like a July 1 uh, start date to like the current month. Um, so that's my other note too. So uh, if you have these, if you uh, start it with like a July 1 date, uh, you, we could even do this, like if we wanted to run this for the full fiscal year dates. Um, so again, this is your expenditure side. So if I enter in fiscal, so I guess this is my next tip. If I enter in fiscal year dates and then run this report, this is going to be, um, this should match my expended amount for fiscal year to date. So um you can run the start and stop dates for fiscal dates. You could run them for month dates and then compare to a month to date. Um, and there are certain other reports where you would see those totals. So you could use this to compare to. So this can be a good balancing tool. All right. So let me just generate this real quick. Let's just get, um, I'm running this so we can get like a base of where we are starting uh, with this report because we're going to run it a few times and look at a couple of different things. So this is our current uh, setup for this uh, budget account activity report. And so we can see we have uh, by cash account, it's kind of split out. And then we have the full account code. And then we have any transactions that are within that. So uh, we also have a type. You can see the type is purchase order, disbursement, um, so things, again, that hit expenditure accounts. Uh, over here, we have the expended amount associated with each transaction. And so this is really giving us like the detail to, um, you know, to everything that's posted. And that's where the, that time range comes in handy. So that's where we're starting. And then um, from here, I'm gonna skip the report format. We'll keep PDF for now. But if we look at the this next section here, so here to about here is, uh, this is a way that we can filter down the report for uh, certain account codes. So if we were to uh, want to use the full account code, this is gonna be, and I do this all the time, so this is a good uh, trick. I mean, granted, I've run this report already, but if you have the, account code uh, from somewhere else. What we want is we want the full account code with the dashes. And that's how you would enter it in this include full account code. Um, so we could do that. And then that will filter it down to generate it for just one account. So if you're looking for something specific, say you're looking at this account and you want to know, okay, you know, what's a total made up of? which actually let's grab a different one, hang on. Let's grab one that has more than just POs. Okay, here, this one has a disbursement. Let's generate this. Let me just do a quick little visual of what I'm talking about here. Uh, with with the fiscal to date totals because I'm sure that like does make sense but sometimes it's like you know sticks a little bit better if we look at it so uh so here's this account so we have um hang on let me do this so here's our account we have 001 uh with a 511 object code and it has two disbursements posted against it so far in this fiscal year those were in July. And the total that we've spent so far is 1,050. Um, so let's come over here and make ourselves a new tab real quick because I don't want to lose our report. And I'm just going to pull up this expenditure account real quick because uh, I, I keep saying, oh, yeah, you know, it's the fiscal to date amount, but... Okay. 
Oh, what was it? The 600. Oops. Here we go. So when we look at this account, let me try and zoom in one here. So when we look at this account right here, actual expended. So here's what was actually expended so far. This fiscal year is the first column is this amount. So far this month, now um, I still have my test instance in July. So the current posting period is July. That check was posted July 31st. So um, this is our month to date expended. And so obviously this is pretty straightforward here. We kind of reversed backwards. But um, if you are looking at this account and you're like, there's some reason like you know this is off from something, say a district's trying to balance something, you've tracked down a difference, um, this can be a way where you're like, okay, I see this amount, but what makes what makes it up? And so an activity report would help with that. Budget account activity is helpful for expenditures. We're going to look at a financial detail in a little bit too, and the financial detail would also help with this. So that's what I mean when I say if we're running it for the fiscal year dates, then it's going to help us be able to um, see what those fiscal figures are made up of, the fiscal to date totals. Okay, so next we have our um, basically the different pieces of our account code. So if we wanted to uh, filter to just a specific fund, we could do that. So let's go ahead and generate here. And this is gonna narrow us down. So now all that's on our account is, um, uh, or all, the, all that's on our report rather, is accounts that just have this specific fund. Um, so we see that's all that's on the report. Now, this is one that I believe we have feedback uh, request issues because uh, like a JIRA issue for an enhancement um, because these on the canned versions are just one uh it's not you don't use a wild card with this so if i want to type in a fund i have to type in e it equals this is the fund that i want it to be um i know there are some scenarios where like say they want all the grant funds so everything starting with you know everything in the 500 funds um or there might be some different situations that they're doing different sorts on here i want you know all the objects that are in this range and so that is something that we've heard feedback about. I know we have a uh, request out there for that is a note to differ to, that differentiates. However, this is one of those things, you know, if you're using the template report because of just the wild cards and then having to have that really long running report, um, I would I would definitely advise considering this option of the filters. So this last one here comes into play. If this is not enough, if you know whatever is whatever is here doesn't give enough flexibility for what this report should be run for, then what you can do is make an account filter for it. And let me hop over. This is my extra tab. So um, utilities account filters. And I have one out here that we're going to look at. This is a simple one just so that we can see what it looks like. Um, but what you can do is you could make an account filter. Um, we have done a training on account filters, so I know there's a recording out there. Um, definitely check out our documentation. So I'm not going to go too sidetrack into this. But uh, when you make the account filter, it does have the ability to accept wild cards or uh, if you wanted to do a range, you can do it's two dots between. Uh, so you could use wild cards or ranges in this. It just have to, has to have this R read-only access if you're using it for reports. And um, then you can apply the filter to any reports. Now, um, one thing we hear is like, I totally understand that this is an extra step. It's like, okay, well, I'm running the report. Why would I want to have to go out, make a filter just to be able to run this report? If you begin using these, like in this case, we're talking about, okay, this is the cafeteria um, fund that we want to see. Uh, this could be, you know, any certain grouping. This could be athletics. This could be, you know, okay, my high school accounts. Like uh, this is what a high school secretary would usually run theirs for. Um, and this could be a common grouping that 
you know, maybe you're going to, maybe you would use it more than one time. Like, yeah, usually you just put it in when you run the report because you know what you're running it for. But if you set this up once, like it's going to be out there. So the next time I run this report, I don't always every single time have to go build an account filter. Um, so when I, when I start using this, I can just start typing it and it'll show up in my drop down. I can take this out. Uh, these can be used in combination with the um, fields here too. So if that's something um, that that helps, but uh, making these strategically can really be a huge uh, help. So let's apply that. Let me show you what that does. And basically what we've done is we've narrowed this down. So we're still just in the 006, but now we only have accounts that have a 500 uh, object code that they're starting with. Okay. All right. So these next two, you know, I, I was thinking about it and I was like, I'm not sure how often we've talked about these on, um, on our reports trainings before, but definitely this next one, show options. Uh, this is such a simple uh, option, <laughs> simple um, feature on these reports. But if you check this box and generate, um, when the report is generated, what it does is it gives a report options page. And basically, this is just like a, a title page summarizing the selections that were made when the report was run. So in this case, hang on, let me zoom in on this. So in this case... That was, there was a filter, cafeteria ASF, that's what I picked. And then here was my start and stop dates. And then immediately after this is my normal report. Like it still has my report here. Sorry, now I'm now I'm super zoomed in. But, uh, but really the benefit here is it using this report options page, like, uh, I'm going to be honest, I forget to use it uh, quite a bit, but usually I'm just running reports on the fly, kind of helping um, you all with troubleshooting something. But um, at the district level, if someone were to use an options page when they run their reports, then if it is something that they need to run again later, this would be an easy way to see this is exactly how I ran this report. If they're comparing one report to another and they maybe thought they were the same maybe they had just the date slightly different and instead of kind of going through and looking at this and just not like maybe assuming how you ran it uh this would be a really easy way to see oh this one had the filter applied to it um additionally uh as um uh, like for your itc support when you're helping your district if they have a question about a report and they can send you the version of the report. If they run that, if they send that to you with this options page, that would help you recreate it um, and then help you know them get support quicker. So uh, this can be a really handy tool. I, I know some districts probably use this all the time, some maybe don't, but uh, I would say when we're talking best practices that this can definitely be a huge tip as far as best practice, just because it, it would be a really easy way to look back at you know exactly how this was generated if you ever needed to um so that can be a really good one and let me just make sure i'm hitting everything here okay okay so real quick what i want to talk about before we get to this summary report option is i want to just hop over here and look at our uh, properties so what we're seeing here is we have um, this, the selected properties is basically showing us how the report is sorted. And we see, okay, the cash account, the account code, and these are both marked as control breaks. When we're seeing this marked as a control break, um, what that's telling me is that this is going to make it a header and a subtotal. And when we look at our report, Wait, let me zoom out on this one more time. Um, when we look at our report, you know, we've been seeing header, header. So both of those were marked for control break. And then we have a subtotal. 
Then when we get to the end, see, this is giving us the subtotals before the grand total. So whenever you have something that's marked as a control break, that's specifically what is going to say, okay, this is going to, um, you know, have it, have it be in that situation. Also, the headers and footers, uh, the headers and subtotals, that is part of a formatting. It's the control break is being included as part of formatting. So that is specific to formatted uh, report for, report output types, which we will see those in a minute. Uh, but I want to mention that um, because we'll we'll keep an eye on um, on that thought here in a minute. So so headers and footers, headers and subtotals, right? When we use this summary report option and we generate this, specifically what this is giving us, the summary, what the summary is is it's only gonna show us the headers and the subtotals without that detail that we saw on the previous report. So headers, headers, and then here, this not bold text is the detail. That's what's being left out of this version. So that's your summary report. Now that's important to know because if you were to be generating a report and it doesn't have any control breaks, if it doesn't have anything set up over here, then it's not going to generate a proper summary report. So if you have a lot of control breaks, then you might see a lot of things on the summary report, um, a lot of headers uh, and a lot of subtotals. So, so that is something to keep in mind as well. All righty. All right, the next thing I want to talk about is um, our different data formats here. So uh, we've been running everything in PDF, but I just want to show our list here. And um, when we're looking at this, we actually reorganized this fairly recently. Um, we have PDF, Excel data, and Excel field names. Let's run it to, uh, do I want to do this first? Let me see. Let me just make sure I'm sticking to my plan a little bit here. Uh, yes, yes, we're going to run this. Oops. Hang on. Of course, it's opening in my other window. Okay, so let me do this. So a couple of things here, when I, so I just generated this, this is what it gives me as the output. Excel does some odd things with formatting sometimes, uh, but the very first thing I'm gonna do, if they have this enable editing, you'll need to enable editing. The next thing, and this is like definitely more of an Excel trick, but it's one that I use whenever I'm looking at these, um, is I just click right in the top left corner here, click right on the arrow, that's your select all. So I select it all. And then um, between any of the columns, now that everything's selected, if I just hover between the columns, I get this little arrow. That's, it's like a line with two arrows. And I'm going to double click. And what that does is it fits every column to the data that's within it. Okay, let's do it again. We're going to do it on the rows now. So I'm over to the left. I'm just going to hover between columns and just double click. And so with those three clicks, I took it from kind of looking a little rough to being like perfectly now form fit to, uh, to the data. So here's what we look like when we're in Excel data. And what this is, what we're gonna notice, so because this is specifically a data format, Excel data is gonna just be like your spreadsheet version. It's just, here's my actual raw data that's got my headers. It's got everything in um, columns that I could now sort and use as like a data source, right? Uh, so why I'm spelling this out so specifically is because I mentioned um, with that uh, summary version that we just looked at, the summary report, notice that there are not headers in here. There are not headers, there are not footers. It never included in a raw data like extract version kind of. So this is like, because it's a data version, it's never gonna show headers and footers. Um, this comes up quite a bit because sometimes people will like set up something that they have in a summary version because it's got the headers and footers that they want. 
and uh, then they'll run it to Excel data and it's got all the detail and they're like, wait a minute. So that's why it's important to remember summary version is only showing you formatting. Um, the Excel version doesn't have any formatting, so it's never going to include those. Uh, if if there's a situation where, you know, there's something that uh, you're trying to get a report for that is, uh, you know, it's at like the level of summary uh, of what you have with the summary report, then usually you need to find a different report object. And um, I'm planning to talk about report objects in a bit. So, so that's that. So this is what we get for an output. Actually, the other thing that I want to point out um, on this report specifically, and let me scroll over here, is that this is the canned report version. If we scroll over, we do have all of the uh, split out account codes. Um, another little like look back thing when we're talking about, um, you know, the reports over time, you know, how you talked about how they changed between uh, from the template to the canned reports. Uh, as we have gone along, the canned reports, we've been making updates to them. Uh, if there are things that need to change with the reports in the future, the ones that have a canned version, we're going to continue to improve the canned version or change it. Um, the template versions are always going to stay the same. At those point, those are like at this point, those are like a reference copy. Um, but any that have a version of the report as a canned report, we're going to continue to improve those. We can make changes if needed. Uh, and this was important because. Um, Back when the the sorting was added, the dynamic sorting was added to the template reports, we had added these fields individually. Uh, and the, the purpose was honestly so that they could be on, you see this sortable properties list in the background. The template reports have these too. So we had added these extra fields uh, so that they could be used for sorting. And kind of a side effect of that was that when it was run in the data version, all the individual codes were on that. But we were like, it's okay, you know, like people can delete them if they don't want them or like they could use them. But it wasn't like added to the template report for any specific purpose. Like it was kind of a side effect, but we're like, it, it was okay. It was an okay side effect. Uh, so when we recreated the canned reports, we originally had left all, all these extra columns off thinking, well, we can prevent the side effect now. So, you know, we'll just leave these off. Um, but the funny part was we found that um, we had feedback that people were using these and like so, like third parties were even using these and like now needed them. So when we heard these, this feedback, we added them to this template report to make sure um, basically our goal is we want you, we want your districts to be able to use these canned reports and have what they need on them. So at this point, I believe like the feedback that we've heard uh, as far as like what they need on um, this Excel data version of the budget account activity, I believe we've made the updates. Um, so if you have districts or if you're uh, watching this later in your district that is using this report, um, if you have a third party that's asking for a budget account activity, especially because I feel like when we've heard about them in the past, it's like they want a full fiscal year. They want to run it through the fiscal year and that template report is going to be very slow especially at the end of the fiscal year because that's going to be a large data set so we want you to be able to use this version um on the can because it's going to run so much faster um and so yeah that's why we've made some of the updates that we have to add these fields here uh and certainly if there's anything else that needs um updated for uh it to be used like uh, we would want to know that so itc's you can definitely submit a ticket to us and um we can um have that as feedback so so that is what we're looking at with the excel data version uh no we're not going to save this uh okay excel field names that looks exactly the same it just has like field names where if you were going to um use a report for like importing data if you're going to manipulate that and then use it to import back in um that has sort of like the standard um headers um and then excel we'll, we'll talk about in a minute here the comma separated values those again are also data formats i'm going to run this real quick we won't talk about the you know super detail here but 
I want to just show when we open this, you, you'll get this pop-up. And it says by default, Excel will perform the following, remove leading zeros. I always click don't convert because I don't want Excel to remove leading zeros from anything that I have it on, mostly the account codes. So uh, that's a good trick there. And then the last one we'll show is um, this Excel version. So uh, what I have, what, when we run this one, because we already looked at running Excel, right? When we run this one, um, just Excel, not Excel data, it is going to maintain the formatting. So this is a little bit different. Um, and what's nice about this though, is that it still gives you some flexibility while also keeping this formatting that you would have for um, for like a PDF version. So in this case, see, we do have headers, we do have subtotals still. So this can still be helpful. Um, another thing, like if you do ever need it, uh, First of all, let me hang on. Let me show. Let me show a couple. I again, I know we're going into like Excel tricks here, but I thought this would be helpful, so I just wanted to show a couple of things. All right. One thing I hear about this when um I've talked, you know, to people about using like if they could maybe use this version for what they're working on, and one thing that's tough is okay. So I have these two totals here, right? I have my totals, and if I wanted to write a formula on it, this plus this. Oh, it is going to work this time. All right. Well, sometimes, sometimes, um, of course, I love when I go off the rails with one little thing and then it's like, okay, I didn't check that. Um, but sometimes what happens or what I'll hear is that that doesn't work. It doesn't always automatically let you run formulas on numbers because when it comes into Excel and it maintains this formatting, it sometimes is looking at it as text. If that happens, what you can do, so I'm gonna select these, and I have this little icon right here, this little uh, triangle with an exclamation point. And so if we see here, the little pop-up, it says the number in this cell is formatted as text or preceded by an apostrophe. And uh, that is where like that text formatting can mess with formulas. If I click this, I have this option that says convert to number and I can convert those to a number. And now I know formulas will work with those. So, and I could do that for, you know, all my numbers here. See, I have the little icon after I select and convert to number. So, you know, any, any report, like if you have a cash summary or something that's got a lot of numbers right in the middle, if you bring that over in this version, um, now I, I can work with um, these figures. The other thing that I've uh, used with these Excel versions sometimes is if I just select this data, okay, I have formatting, like I really kind of wanted more of a data format, but for some reason I pulled it. I mean, on, th on this specific report, you could just pull the data um, version. But if you ever need to, I can copy this and then, I'm a little zoom things getting in the way. And then if I make another sheet, and um, when I paste this, I can paste as values is what the option is. Paste as values. And that's an easy way that I now have this data um, in a listing. So, I mean, generally, if you're if you are uh, running it to the um, Excel, then you're probably fine with that. But I don't know those in certain cer certain situations, those have come in handy. The other thing that uh, I hear with this is uh, if we go to look at the print preview, um, these versions, so it does vary from like what you would see on um, like the regular PDF report. You see the header is not in here. It defaults to like a custom margin to kind of show everything. You could add, uh, let's see, which one is it? Insert, insert header and footer. And you can use Excel to enter, you know, custom headers, uh, or you could just keep it simple and have it be, you know, report or budget account activity report. Um, I've worked on these before where somebody wanted even like the full header showing the district name and there's a way to insert images. So you could just insert that. Um, so if you really wanted to manipulate this, like, 
and basically I think one reason that you could use this is if you want um you know it's going to be a report that they're going to put together and like present to someone or like include in some material um because the other thing that you could do is like say we don't really care about showing the fiscal today unencumbered but let me delete some of this data whoops <laughs> uh say we want a notes column and we can say okay this is what the reason for these disbursements for and then um this is where we're going to include some more information xyz um you know more info we need to buy these again next year or whatnot like if there is some situation where that helps to kind of have here's everything that we spent in this group here's the things specifically that we bought um, and then, you know, here's some information. It gives you that sort of flexibility. So, okay. All right. Are we sick of the budget account activity report yet? <laughs> oh, no, I have one more thing. Um, okay. All right. All right. Last thing on this one, and then we'll move on, is uh, I also want to talk about this uh, save and recall up here. So this, basically what we use this for is this would save the parameters that we've run this with. So now we're talking about different date ranges. If they add different filters in here, uh, you can come in here and um, give it a name. So I click the blank one, give it a name, tab, and then save. And now it's in my list. So next time I come in here, I can just do the cafeteria activity from the list and uh, it'll pull up these options. The other important ones here, most recent, this is what basically saves, like if I go in and out of this report, it's always going to come back and be able to show me the um, what I ran it as this last time. The other thing you can use is default, and that's always going to set it back to just the original like default, uh, basically clear everything out in most cases uh, for the report. So that's like a really easy way if you've been running it and you just want to get back to the basics that you can do that. All right. All right. So um, let me move on here. Uh, I know I spent quite a while on that, so um, we'll... Uh, hop into the next section that I have. And, <laughs> you know, I was uh, going through what I want to talk about. And I'm trying to um, kind of talk about some different facets here today. And I know this is a reports training, but I thought it would also be helpful to uh, sort of talk about grids versus reports. Because when we're talking best practice, like especially for reports, um, one of the things that I think is important to remember is that a lot of these reports, they're based off of grids. I mean, they are. They're they're based off of the report object, which in our software is very closely tied to the grids. And so one thing that I would consider a best practice is considering like, you know, what the situation is. Certainly there's situations where like, yes, they just need a cache summary. They're going to save that cache summary. Um, I need a report for a certain thing, but if there's a situation where you're just trying to like search for data, look up data, reports absolutely can be helpful, but sometimes it's just as helpful to be able to use the grid to look up that information. Um, and then you could also use the grid to like sort of start a report. So we're going to talk about that too. And for this, um, I'm sticking with this theme of activity reports. And so we're going to talk about the activity ledger. Now, um, when I come to this activity ledger grid, this is specifically a lookup grid. Like I'm not creating any transactions from this activity ledger. This is specifically for searching through um, the data that I have and looking up transactions and transaction types. Um, the other benefit to this grid where it's different than like your purchase order grid or your disbursement grid is that it's going to show one line per line item on the transaction. So I could have um, one purchase order, but I could have you know 10 line items on that purchase order. And on this activity ledger, I'm gonna have a different line for each one of those 10 items. 
And the reason that's helpful is because the different items could have different account codes, they have our different descriptions, they have different details. And so this activity ledger gives you all of that in a searchable way. The other reason this is really important um, to keep in mind or, you know, with using this activity ledger is pretty much, I mean, all the activity reports that I can think of, um, mostly they're built off of the activity uh, ledger object, basically. So like when we are looking at, when we were looking at our budget account activity, hang on, let's go to one that's not, you know, see, look at, we have this type, we have disbursements, we have PO, we have disbursements. Um, when I'm looking at my activity ledger, I have my types here. So uh, what I'm trying to say here is that this is like an interactive version of those reports. Um, and it just, it depends on like how you set this up, what columns you want, uh, but this can be a really helpful tool. So uh, so let's, let's get rolling here on um, our example. Okay. And uh, the one thing that I wanted to show actually here, let me look at my more option. Let's see what we have. So the first thing I'm gonna do, I'm just gonna review what columns we have on here and let's like add and remove um, as we want. Let's put our PO number on there, date, PO number, uh, I have check and receipt number. And then I have this section here for account. I, I'm gonna add the full account code but I also have the section here for code, and this is uh this is new. This is newer uh within the last uh within at least this year. I would say the last couple months. Um, the type is what we were looking at with, you know, what transaction type is it? Item description. But here, fund, function, receipt, object, um, special cost center. All of these we have every single piece of the account code that we can put directly on this grid and use to sort on. In this case, I've added the expended and the received amount, remaining encumbrance, and the status. The status, let's see, the status is this one that we can see in the background, and that helps with like your invoice status or um, if a check is void. So I like having that one on there. And we have our vendor name and number. And um, okay, so then at the bottom here, if you're adding, if you wanna add certain things, um, from like, okay, a disbursement, I could open oops, disbursement and then um, open a couple levels here. And this would give me access to any disbursement specific fields, anything specifically that's on a check that I might wanna see, I could add to my grid here. But let's go, so, uh, oh darn, I did change something. So uh, if we look at this now, let me kind of organize my data here because we, we do have a lot of things on this grid. But if I scroll over, you can see all of my account code columns, right? Beautiful, beautiful. And what I can do is start adding filters here. So. Um, you know, we talked about, we're, like, we're going to kind of stick with our same example. Let's do, I think if I just do five, yeah, it's going to just give me my 500 objects. So I could enter a wild card or I can just leave this as is. So this is like similar to that filter that we had, um, applied on to our budget account activity. Um, in this case, though, we have left it so that it's going to include uh, revenue type transactions, too. So we kind of have everything here. Let's filter this. If I enter a date, uh, it's going to be like that date and after. I could, again, do a range with like the two dots that we looked at earlier. Um, but this is kind of a simple sort here. If I scroll down. Now this is that same, a same like data set that we were looking at on our report, except for it's all interactive. Um, and then I could say, okay, well, maybe I want to search on the item description now for any that had honey. So now I've narrowed it down and I can see, let's see, uh, here's my purchase order, invoices, disbursements for my honey. And, um, I guess like one, you know, one thing I can think with this example, we're looking at this fiscal year. 
but like maybe last fiscal year I had ordered honey and I want to see you know what those transaction numbers were I've been able to narrow this list down uh, interactively without putting in any transaction numbers I didn't know the PO number before this all right so uh, again I know we're probably Amanda this is a reports training right <laughs> so uh where this where this works though is if I go up to the top here and I do this report button, I could run this grid right to a report. So if I go generate report, we can generate a report right from there. Now, it is not pretty. Okay, didn't promise a pretty report because we got a lot of stuff on there. But I can get a report and I can show you how to make it better. Um, the next The next run we're going to do, let's make it Excel data because that's a spreadsheet. Okay, so now I've filtered my grid and I've got an output um, in a spreadsheet of exactly those options. And now I could sort and filter from here if I wanted to do that. Again, this information, you know, the type, um, the amounts that we're looking at, this is, uh, the same information that my budget account activity is based off of. So, you know, this is going to be the same information that's coming from, you know, my reports that I may use, but just in an interactive way. Uh, and then the, the other thing we can do from here. So let me scroll down. Actually, I might need to here. I'm going to zoom out for a second here. Um, right at the bottom. This is what we're looking at. Save as. Um, and we're going to go, actually, you know what? Yeah, that's fine. We'll save this report, cafe info. All right. So report has been saved as cafe info. That's great. If we go to our report manager, now we have the cafe info here. And, uh, what we can do is we could just generate the report again, but obviously as a PDF, we know that was not very pretty. We can go edit that now, though, if we want, if that's something that we want to use. Or run later, you know, so now I don't have to go, say I go change my activity ledger grid because I'm looking for something else, but I want to come back and, and search for this again. I might sort of have that saved. But what we're seeing here is when I open up this report, all of these, um, all of these, uh, call it basically like rows that we're seeing all these properties that are on the select properties these are the columns that were on our grid we had the date we had the check number receipt number everything that we picked from that more option we had the status received and expended all of our fun code pieces so this was everything that we had on our grid when i go to configure filters these were the things that we typed in on our grid. Remember, we typed in honey. We filtered it to the 006. So this was a really easy start to making this custom report because all we had to do was type in what we wanted on the grid instead of go configure this in a report. Um, let me do this though. I'm gonna uh I'm gonna take out that object code filter. And if we come to our report properties, I'm just going to clean this up a little bit because, you know, like I said, it wasn't very pretty. Uh, we're running kind of low on time. So I'm just going to kind of go through and do a couple things. Um, hopefully not too quickly here, but a little quick. First, I'm going to take out our additional account code pieces. When we're actually looking at this report, we don't need all the individual ones. So let's just delete these off of the report. Subject. Okay. Because I do have the full account code. So let's keep the full account code up here. The status was giving us like the invoice status or the void. Let's take that off. We don't really need that. Uh, PO number. Mm. Yes, we'll keep that. And received amount, expended amount, item description. Let's go look. So let me save this. 
Let's go look at generating the report. So this last tab here would let me generate while we're within like sort of the edit mode to see what we're working with. Okay, this is looking better because I have, you know, my columns aren't all crowded here anymore. I have the information that I want. Uh, let's see. Okay, we have the total. Hmm. I thought I had some receipts in this fund, but. Oh, it's because I have my, let's take, take off the honey filter. And let's do this too. Let's change this from portrait to landscape. So it has a little bit more room. Okay, so that's a good, so see, we do have, um, we do have some receipt, some receipts in here. And you could do, we could continue to edit this, right? We could take out the POs if we didn't want POs in here. Um, we could add headers, like if we wanted to go ahead and add these account um, headers, like that's what we saw on our budget account activity. Uh, the other thing that we're kind of formatting this as right now is a uh, financial detail. This looks very similar. Um, if we were to go run a financial detail, let me save this. Financial detail report. And uh, look, I happen to have the 006 in there. <laughs> And so you see, we have um, basically the same information. On my version, I had included the vendor name though. So, uh, you know, so basically what I'm trying to show here is there's flexibility, right? So these canned reports that I've been talking about absolutely is a super quick way to be able to run the basic info. But, you know, when we're looking at maybe a situation where there's something more specific that you're trying to find or trying to see, uh, there's ways to... Um, use maybe a grid instead of uh, instead of um, or or a grid to a report instead of just having just what's on the report. Uh, the other thing I should have showed before we hopped out of this uh, editing this um, report. This was a big. I was supposed to show this first. Right here, select object. So whenever you're customizing or building a report. The object right here is what all of your properties are based on. Everything in this view is based on what object the report is built on. And we can see that right here, the object is activity ledger. And so, and if we were to go look at some of these other reports, like the SSDT ones, even if we were to go look at like that template version um, of the budget account activity report, when we open this, that's also built on the activity ledger. So when I say that that activity ledger is like an interactive version of these reports, it really is. Uh, so, okay. So that's also another thing to keep in mind. When when do I use reports versus when do I use a grid? And uh, we're pretty much, I know we're at time. Gosh, I feel bad I keep doing this. I'm like trying to keep myself to an hour here. I want to talk about uh, report bundles too. So if anybody has to hop out, I totally understand. Um, I know we usually do these for an hour. This is being re recorded if you need to hop back later. Uh, but I'm going to go ahead and talk about the report bundles um, before we wrap up today while we're here. So uh, let's go here, report bundles. And I have this on my list for best practices because I think there's a couple different uses for this. Um, so when you're in here, like I have, I'm, I'm in the admin account, so I can see any report bundles that are created, whether it's mine or in this case, um, this other user that I had, uh, Amanda was in here, a manager was in here, and I can see any report bundles. Each individual user, like if I don't have admin reports access, I could still see my own report bundles. I could still make my own report bundles. and. One thing that I think is pretty common the bundles are used for at this point is um, to uh, set them up, you know, if the maybe the treasurer is going to set them up to send to their building, um, like their building staff, you know, they can uh, make a bundle that can automatically email 
reports for like showing their budgets, uh, showing their POs, uh, that sort of thing. Um, the other thing that I think could be a good use of this is if there are reports that um, any individual user would want to run for themselves regularly, they can set those up in a bundle and then be able to come in and run those on demand uh, to be able to just basically run multiple reports with one click. So, you know, we've talked a lot about the activity reports. If they're going to run an activity report and like a budget summary, and they're always just going to come in here and do that instead of having to go through and, you know, run the reports individually every single time, that could be an option. So let's look at this. In order to create a report bundle, you come in here and we can do, oh, look at that, cafe reports. We're going to stick with our theme today. And, nope, too far. Um, so we'll give it our name. And then when we want to add reports, what we can do is, so from this drop down, we can start typing and uh, let's do a uh, financial detail. And um, we have a few different versions here, financial detail report. I'm gonna select this one. Um, you know what, let me, let's go, this is where I wanted to go to the documentation though, cause I know this can be confusing. Um, if we go to, rep uh, yeah, report bundles. And I'm gonna go to the user generated report bundles section. We have a list here that tells us um, what the what the canned reports can be used in the bundle and what they're called. Now, um, this one, this is specific, and I um, look to this list sometimes because the, the naming is important here. Um, hang on, let me go back. You know what, let me pick. Okay, so budget summary is a good example. So with the budget summary, I have budget summary or I have budget summary report. Uh, if I were to refer to this list, I can see it's budget summary report is the canned version. So that's the version that I'd want to select if I want to run the canned version. So I'm sorry, I know that's a little bit confusing, but that is your trick for figuring out which one of those you should pick. So we'll add that there and then... Um, Purchase order detail, select that one. And we'll add that. Once we add our reports, um, you can go in here and we could um, edit the parameters. And this is gonna give you similar to options to like what you would see. This would be the same options as what you would see if you were running the report. Um, on demand, like from the menu, um, come in here and let's go ahead and add our filter in there. We could generate this on the fly to see what it looks like and confirm that looks how we want it to. Um, or we can go ahead and just continue and that'll save it down here in our report options. Uh, so let's do, oh, you know what? I had the wrong one said that okay if you want to as this we're just looking at how to remove it if you want to remove it from your bundle we can go ahead and click the x purchase order detail report is going to be our canned version that's helpful though because you can see uh we can see that <laughs> um when uh we actually went to go edit it i could tell based on that view that it was um that it was the template version, not the canned. Okay, so also uh, the other thing is with most of these, the uh, when we're selecting it, there's multiple versions here you see popped up. We talked about the save and recalls earlier. So if you do have a save and recall where you saved the parameters a certain way, then that would be able to pull up and add to the bundle. And so in this case, most recent, I'm, I picked that one because when we go in here, now, um, I had previously run this for outstanding. Um, let's go ahead. We'll add a filter. 
And so this would, oh, and then we could even do like show report options. Um, and then we'll save that. And so that is how now, whenever this bundle is going to run, it's going to use those options that we selected for each of these reports. So I can save that up. And um, then the clock icon here is how we would either schedule or run this. Now, the reason I wanted to bring this up on best practices, I know this is something um, we've had some questions about. Um, I think, you know, as we go, more districts are setting this sort of thing up. But uh, you could set this up on an event. And if you set this up on posting period close completed event is what you want. You want the one that says completed. If you set this up to run on the close completed event, then it automatically is going to kick off this report bundle every time the posting period is, every time a posting period is closed. So at the end of each month, once the district balances, when they closed up, then it's gonna go ahead and generate the report bundle and send that to whoever's in this output field, which would be like an email address. If you set these up, if you set up custom report bundles, to send on this posting period close complete event, it's important to remember that those need to finish before you change the current period to the next one. Um, if your reports are running based on current period things like, so a budget summary is gonna show month to date figures or show fiscal to date based on um, the period. So if you do set these up, then that's part of like when you're when they're doing their closing that they do need to keep in mind. Um, or in this case, so if I just have immediate, so say, say I just made the bundle and I didn't come in here and do anything right away, I could run this as immediate, I put in my email address and then save this and it's just going to run those reports and send them to my email. And this is the option where I think, you know, especially so say, yeah, I'm going to run these to review uh, every week or every month or that sort of thing. And, you know, maybe that's the treasure or maybe this is just even a user, you know, another user at the district, they want to check their budgets regularly and they um, come in here. Now, the treasurer might set up the automatic bundles because everybody might not want to come in here and make their own. <laughs> but if you have some users that, you know, are doing more in the software and have something they run regularly, this can be a really good thing because as soon as they do immediate, it'll go ahead and run any reports that are in this list and, and attach it to an email. And in this case, we did two, but what if it's five? You know, what if it's five reports? Like, what if it's, you know, more than that? And they know that they're going to run those and maybe they just save them. Um, but at least that would be easier to set up once and then be able to generate whenever instead of having to go in and generate each individual report you know, to save like each time they would, they would do it. So uh, multiple uses with this. And I think that that can be a really helpful um, thing to do. Okay. Uh, the other one that I guess I, I kind of breezed by there. Um, so I'll just mention it while we're on this page is the cron job was this first one. Um, this can be use a cron expression to schedule on a regular interval. Uh, this is definitely in the documentation if that's something that um, they want to do. So basically, instead of running every time the period closes, you could set this up so that it runs every Monday or, you know, once a month on a certain date. Uh, so that's like a way to pinpoint a more like specific interval and have it repeat. Okay. All righty. Well, thanks for sticking with me, um, even though I went over. But, uh, you know, sometimes it's just nice to just go ahead and still uh, get that information um, out here while we're talking. Uh, do we have any questions on anything that we talked about with the reports today? Okay. All right. Well, you know, <laughs> it's funny because I feel like we have a training like this and I'm like, I could talk to you for another three hours about reports probably. <laughs> so uh, we'll keep adding info um, here. Of course, if you have questions, uh, let us know. And um, thank you so much for attending. Everyone have a great weekend.